I'm Chad Main, founder of legal services company Percipient, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal innovation and legal technology. On today's show, I have a conversation with Andy Wilson. He's the CEO of electronic discovery software company Logical. I'm pretty sure most listeners of this podcast know what electronic discovery or e-discovery software is. If you don't, it's software that lets you easily search and review electronic documents like email messages, word processing documents, and other common everyday file types. It's called e-discovery because it's often used to review data during the discovery phase of litigation. But e-discovery software has all kinds of other uses like reviewing contracts during due diligence and M&A deals or processing Freedom of Information Act requests by government agencies. Today's conversation is with Andy Wilson. He's the CEO of Logical, which is a cloud-based e-discovery software platform. In my opinion, it's not only one of the best pieces of legal tech software, it's also one of the best-run legal tech companies out there. My company, Percipient, has been a longtime customer of Logical, and we're big fans. Logical itself just turned 10 years old at the beginning of this month, but Andy's been involved in e-discovery well before it was even a thing. Fresh out of college with a computer science degree in hand, a buddy helped Andy get a job at a printing company with the promise that there was a technology component to the printing company. What Andy would later find out is what the printing company was doing was printing out email messages so they could be used in a legal matter. The absurdity of printing out something that's supposed to be in electronic format was not lost on Andy. So after a couple years at the printing company, he and a college classmate that also happened to work at the printing company decided to launch Logic System because they knew there was a better way to handle this electronic data. Logic System was doing great until the economy crashed around 2008 and 2009. But it was during this downturn that Andy and Shen saw the future of e-discovery in the cloud, and that's when they decided to launch Logical. It took four plus years to develop the software, but they persevered, and in 2013, Logical went live. But before we get to Logical, let's hear Andy talk about his early days. They were using some program called ZPrint, I believe, that would make it easy to print electronic data and batch to a printer. And then they, they actually did, they hired my co-founder, actually, to build an FTP applet, a Java applet, which really don't exist anymore, but so that their customers could FTP them data to print. So they <laughs> print. Exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. It's like, are you serious? Because they were driving back and forth or, or taking shipments of CDs and hard drives and thumb drives and stuff. And so the eureka moment was, what if they could digitally send it to us? So is that where you met your co-founder or had you known him prior? No, I met him at uh, Virginia Tech. Okay, so yeah. did you get in the job or did you know the same same buddy? that? No, it was actually totally random. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, totally random. So you were working at the print shop for a while, but then you and Shen launched Logic Systems after yes. the, the, the working at the print shop. And instead of, you're, you're still dealing with email, you're processing them, but you're keeping them digital, right? Yeah. So what was that process like? What were you doing? Why did they need you to do it at that point? So we had this idea in like 2003 or something, you know, when we were working at this company and we're talking about like where this future is going to go. And we wanted to, um, you know, build a product for that future. We realized the future is going to be all digital. Like this is insane. You know, you look at these things and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. This won't continue. And so what would that look like? And so the idea was really simple. It's like, okay, let's build a program that can process large amounts of data, index it, organize it, make it all searchable, and then just package it up and send it back to the customer so that they could have an electronic copy before they print it. <laughs> <laughs> How is it searchable? What was the functionality? There was no functionality. It was just making a database. You know, I think about like making an access database. That's kind of what it was. The technology was pretty advanced for its time. We, we copied... Um, some patterns from Google's Big Table project, which became Hadoop, which is the open right. source version of, of Google's original big web crawler and indexing engine. And so we were like, okay, well, this seems like a great product for discovery. Let's use aspects of that and build our own product around that. And originally we were thinking we would sell this as a product to law firms, but it didn't have any user interface. It was a command line Product And we were naive tech entrepreneurs thinking we could sell command line software to <laughs> partners at law firms. And you know, we got laughed out of the room pretty quick. Uh, won't touch that one. Yeah. <laughs> so you're doing well. You're making money. I mean, by all accounts, pr- really profitable. Then 2008, yeah. economy takes a crash. 
Yes. So I read somewhere you thought about quitting at that point, but then instead of doing that, you figured out that there needed to be a change with how this data is processed in general. And the cloud was coming. It should go to the cloud. But what was it about the crash? I mean, you're, you're on the brink of quitting, but instead of doing that, you do a whole, not 180 per se, but you, you kind of change your model a little bit and try to do something for the future. What was it about the economic environment that, that gave you this idea? Well, I mean, it, it's kind of like where we started, really, you can step back and you, you ask some basic questions around, is this the type of business that will exist in the future? You know, is this a good business to continue with? Because we want to build something, you know, that we're really proud of and, you know, that we can do for a long time. And we just came to the realization that, like, there's just no way that people are going to continue to do this. Like, we were working on, it's so interesting because today, like, Logical is not known for this, and that's on purpose. But we were working on some of the largest litigation second request projects ever at the time. We were the guys processing the data, you know, the guys behind the curtain, so to speak. We just came to the realization that this is too complex. It's too expensive. It's too slow. It makes no sense that we're doing. And we look at our own process. We're like 90 plus percent of what we're doing is automated. You know, and there's a lot of steps. And it's like, well, what if that's the case? Like, can it get to 100 percent automation? And so we did this whole thought, you know, experiment to see what that would look like. And we came away with like, wow, it really can. It's just going to take a lot of work because what we what we have to do is we've got to we've got to build a self-service interface, which we didn't have an interface, right? It was all command line stuff. And it has to be dead simple because the market that we realized would be a good one for us to go after is not the large litigation market. It was the larger part of the pie. If you think about the overall like matters that have discovery type of use cases, the vast majority of them, 99% plus, are not these big bet the farm, you know, litigation second requests. They're not. They're run of the mill. And there's going to be more of them. So our guess was, you know, okay, well, data volume is going to go up and to the right. That's going to create more opportunities for discovery software. But it has to be designed in a certain way so that non-experts can use it. And that's where we came up with the mission of democratizing discovery. Ultimately, you change your name to Logical. Yeah. Your formal launch is in 2013. So it's taking you four years. I think 2009 is when you really got serious about creating the product. What were you doing for those four years? I mean, obviously, you're developing the product, but what took up the time? What were the steps? Not dying. (laughs) (laughs) Not not to die. Uh, You know, cash is the lifeblood of any company. And we had millions of dollars in cash that was just sitting on the sidelines that we, we put into the company to hire engineers. And this was pre-cloud, right? So we had to build our own cloud from scratch. We bought servers from scratch, like parts and built servers. We had a direct fiber line that we had to dig up on K Street in Washington, D.C. to uh, connect with our data center in Ashburn, Virginia. So this is all pre-AWS becoming the default for any kind of cloud company. We had to basically build our own cloud. And, you know, I mean, that stuff takes time, right? Like building, and we basically built a mini AWS. We built a dynamic processing cluster. We built an entire elastic storage um, cluster. And um, that was very expensive, cost millions of dollars and took longer than it, than it should. But so we're building that. And at the same time, we're running the services business because we got to fund it. You know, we're not, we didn't raise money. It was a terrible time to be doing any of that period, right? So we had to, to make ends meet by selling more and more, you know, consulting work and contracting work. And we got really lucky at times. Like we got lucky with the Bank of America countrywide loan crisis that we made uh, enough money to keep the, the company going for another six months. So yeah, we were seesawing back and forth. So you bring up a good point there. You were a services business. You were processing data, mm-hmm. dealing with big pieces of litigation. But this has been what I gather as a longtime logical customer and just knowing your backstory and working with all you for so long. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you have purposely set out to create a SaaS-based tech company versus a legal tech company. Um, Correct. Because if you compare logical to some other, it doesn't even have to be e-discovery software, legal tech software out there, a lot of it still has this feel of it's a legal related business first, tech second. Yes. If and when did you make that decision, we're going to be a tech company with a focus on legal versus a legal company with a little bit of tech? 
uh, from the very early days. And it starts with like the product design. We wanted to make the product, generic's not the right word, but like I, I didn't want it to be e-discovery-fied, you know? Like the, there's words in e-discovery that are so jargony. Um, <laughs> like e-discovery? <laughs> Yeah, d- document productions. It's like, what the hell are these words? Tar, you know, all the, there's so much jargon to make it more complicated than it needs to be. And it blocks out a lot of people from using the technology because it's scary, right? And so we wanted to make it easy and not scary. So if you think about that, like you need non-legal people to do that, right? You're not going to find legal people that have, they just don't. So you need to kind of work backwards from that and, and build your, your company and your, and your culture in that way. And additionally, like we saw a much broader opportunity beyond, you know, legal. And that's turned out to be true. You know, logical is now in IT, it's in HR, it's in audits, it's in M&A teams. We've even had authors use it for searching through documents as they prep for their own, like writing of a book. Interesting. Yeah, we had a, a, a videographer recently uh, needed to search through a bunch of video files and dumped a bunch of that stuff in there. So, you know, it's not like that's our target market, obviously, but we wanted to build it in a way so that if people found the, the technology helpful, uh, they could use it without a, a big learning curve. When we come back in just a minute, Andy explains how Logical develops user-friendly features and also explains how pricing is a very important consideration for legal technology companies. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. Technically Legal is presented by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal and compliance teams with legal operations, corporate compliance, and process automation. We can assist with managed document review, electronic discovery, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and we can also help develop process-driven legal workflows. To learn more, visit percipient.co, percipient.co. Percipient, legal services powered by technology. We'll get back to my conversation with Andy Wilson in just a second. But before I do, I wanted to let you know if you go to tlpodcast.com, there's an episode page for every episode we do, including today's with Andy. On those pages, you'll find more information about our guests and links to some of the stuff we talk about. Okay, let's get back to my conversation with Andy Wilson, CEO of Logical. We pick back up with Andy explaining how they develop user-friendly features. So you say you brought on tech people purposely because it needed design and easy to use piece of technology. But interestingly, I remember the first time I used it, and I had used other electronic discovery software before and they're, they were cumbersome. I mean, this is almost 10 years ago now. I started using it before that, but logical, when the first time I used logical, it would have been 2013, 2014. But the thing that struck me about it was, well, this is how a lawyer thinks. I mean, this is how I would do stuff and try to find stuff. So you have technologists designing this. So how did you make it so it works so well for lawyers? A lot of sit down side by side research. So the way that we developed logical and the way it's kind of the way we, we develop today. It's just a little bit more efficient. We design everything first, right? So we, we put all the user interface design, we create like, kind of a low fidelity prototype and then we go to high fidelity and i would literally go and sit down next to somebody that i thought would be someone who could use it and have them just tell me what they think and then we just use our product intuition to figure out oh okay that's why they need that and oftentimes you know what we would hear are like where well, i really want this right and it's like hmm and the mistake that i think a lot of legal tech in particular product creators make is that they stop there And they say, okay, and then they slap a button on it, you know, like, okay, now you have X, right? You're happy. What you need to do is like, tell me why. You kind of go to the, you know, the five whys framework. And when you do that, and this doesn't always work, but when you do that, you will often find like, oh, they actually don't want that. They actually need this other thing. And so if we build this other thing, that's not only going to solve this problem, but maybe it's going to solve all these other problems. And we're going to do it in a way that's more you know, democratized, right? So more people can use it. And so that's how we did it. So we did a lot of design work and uh, research. You guys are always developing new features constantly and you're always collecting feedback. How do you do that? How do you collect your feedback? How do you prioritize it when you're getting it from your customers? Well, it starts with like the target customer that you, you want to build more for. Like we, we serve as so many different types of customers now, right? But in terms of the type of customer that we're leaning more into is what we consider a more cloud forward company. If you think about like the bets that we need to make as a company, right? So we're a cloud company and we're like, okay, we're obviously betting on the cloud. 
And therefore, there is going to be more and more cloud related things that we need to build. So like integrations as an, as an example, let's just use one of those. And so we've recently announced a, a really killer Slack integration that is not just a Slack integration, it's also a new paradigm around chat-based discovery so that we can apply it to other types of you know, chat tools. Because it's not enough just to slurp in all the data from a tool that's like not helpful because then you're you're basically just forcing people to keyword search and guess, right? So like the way we look at it is like, okay, let's take this data in and then let's organize it in a way so that people have a better picture of what's inside the data and they can interact with it in, in unique ways. And so, you know, it starts with that cloud forward model, like, okay, we want to find more people like that. And then when we are, um, uh, so you kind of work backwards on the customer. And then when we're thinking about ideas, we will create a picture you know, like a design, and then we'll just share with them either through a prototype link on Figma or like a screenshot over email. And we have a whole list of people that we share that out with. That's a usually a good starting point. You get asynchronously, you know, because synchronous communication for research can be really helpful. But in the early days, that asynchronous stuff is is oftentimes the uh, the fastest and best approach to know if we're on the right track. While we're on the subject for developing tech, primarily for lawyers, I've read or heard you say this a couple of times. You say that as an entrepreneur, you should consider creating a legal tech company because legal is generally behind the curve. Yeah. And so there's a lot of opportunity. I understand that facially. I totally understand that. But you've already alluded to a couple of things here that sometimes it's not easy to sell change in tech to lawyers. So how do you hold this view? You talked about selling a command line product to lawyers. That, that, that ain't easy. So you see the opportunity, but you know there's the selling part might be hard. So how do you reconcile those two in your mind? I actually recently told this to an entrepreneur who's uh, trying to crack into the legal space. I phrase this in a question. I say, what percentage of your time when you're thinking about your product is devoted to pricing and packaging? And I almost always know what the answer is going to be. It's going to be, oh, you know, just a little bit. And I was like, no, give me a percentage. Like if you were going to spend a thousand hours on developing a product, what percentage of those thousand hours is going to be spent understanding the business model, the pricing and the packaging that is going to work so that you can unlock a true product market fit? And it's almost always single digits, right. right, of that. And that, I think, in legal in particular, is probably the biggest mistake. It's a mistake that all entrepreneurs make. They don't think about the price to value. They don't think about how somebody's going to buy, what their willingness to pay is. They just don't think about that because they're obsessed with pixels and not pricing, right? Because that's what they love to do. And then that makes total sense. I did the same thing. And that's where this kind of advice is coming from. And so the way I think to unlock a lot of that product value and innovation inside of legal, which there is, is you need to understand what that price is going to be so that the customer idea, if you're selling to law firms as an example, uh, the way to think about with law firms is like, could you price your product in a way where they could pass it on as a cost to their client? Because that's how it mainly works. Like almost all the money that's, that's spent in legal is passed through from law firm to client matter, right? And if you can do that, that's great. If you can't do that, then you need to really figure out, is your product going to help you make the law firm more money? Because that's their profit centers, you know, that's what they're trying to do is it can help them capture more time, those kinds of things. And you can price accordingly. For legal in particular, to crack the code there, you got to align incentives and incentives and pricing in particular. So if you can if you can do that, then you can really figure out like what are the product components of that to create a great product experience. But it basically starts with that pricing and packaging and incentive alignment. That kind of goes hand in hand with something you said. You did a presentation at uh, Saster and you said you should sell the way your customer wants to buy. Yes, that's another way of saying that. Yeah. And so how does Logical do that? How do you sell the way your customer wants to buy? This took some time to unlock, but I mean, what we realized with Logical is that we're an events-driven business right? There is an event. They need software like Logical to help solve the event. I've used the word like, okay, people are kind of on fire and we're selling buckets of water at times, right? But you've got to sell it in the right way so that they don't feel like they're, you know, they're paying too much. And the way that we've done this is because it's event, 
and it's not always consistent event. You might not have a litigation investigation, a public records request or whatever, every single day or every month. You might have one a year. Why would you need a subscription for that? You know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So we've built a bimodal business model so that customers can buy, buy the drink, pay as you go if they want, or they can buy a subscription if they have two things. They have more consistent need and they want more valuable features because we, you know, the subscription customers are ones that we look at and say, okay, these are our customers that are probably going to be with us for 10 plus years. And so we want to kind of give back to them in a different way. Obviously, we support our customers the same way. Like we give them all world class support and, you know, a good price and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but the subscription customers get better unit economics, better pricing, better feature functionality. And so you have the choice. You can go down, you know, pay by the drink or you can go down by, by subscriptions. That's how we do it. Another thing you said, too, in that presentation was when you're figuring out your pricing, part of the consideration should be what value you are bringing or giving to your customer. This is something I've struggled with from day one, because when you're trying to explain how tech provides value to legal, it ain't always easy. It's not always easy. It's hard to... It's hard to articulate, but it is there. I mean, it saves hours and hours and thousands and millions of dollars. So how have you found the best way to articulate the value using logical brings versus the old school way of handling e-discovery? However, however it is, your customer might have done it prior. Great question. And it's one of these other kind of P words that are really important. And it's really related to pain and quantifying pain. So you have to quantify pain. And in the world of legal, and this is true of almost any kind of business product, uh, but in legal, this is more true than others because there's so much money being wasted and that's painful. So you have time pain and you have money pain. And it's the job of the product, primarily the salesperson does this, right? They're kind of like a tech doctor, right? It's like, okay, where does it hurt, right? How bad does it hurt? And then you quantify that. And the way that we do that is, is really straightforward. Because logical is, in many ways, it's like a robot. You previously would either, um, your previous state was either outsourcing to e-discovery vendors, right? Or it's doing it manually, internally. One, you know, really painful stuff there. Or you're using an, a legacy tool internally, right? The middle one is what we call non-consumption. Clayton Christensen coined this term, non-consumption. It's the biggest competitor of any technology company. It means I'm doing this job. I have this job to be done, but I am not going to consume the right software to get this job done. And the only way you can get those people off that status quo line is to have them realize what that's costing them, right? And so you have to quantify that pain. And so the way to quantify that pain, like in our world, it's pretty straightforward. It's like, okay, well, how long did it take you to do X? How many times per week or per month or per year do you have to do X? Okay, boom. Now you've got some simple algebra that you can work with, right? That's time savings. And you can apply that everywhere. Like, okay, what about Y? What about Z? You know, to walk me through that. And then you kind of summarize. You're like, holy crap, you're spending X thousands of hours doing this per year. Did you know that? And they're like, holy shit, I didn't know that. You know? And so now you've got them off the status quo line because they're realizing, oh my God, if I continue this way, it's going to get even worse, right? Right. And that's the right mindset to be because you have to show them the better way. It's like, look, if you could do it a better way using logical, like how much time do you think you could save? Like, here's what our customers typically do. And then you have a delta so that now you have quantified pain and then you have potential value to gain. And then you can verify that through a simple experiment, which in SaaS world is like a free trial or, you know, in our market, you can just put a credit card in and you know try it out for real uh, on a pay by the drink and it works great. Sweet. You know, you've got an easy ROI. The cost part of it can be more complicated, but in legal, there's two ways that you save money in legal in our world. And it's how much are you spending with e-discovery vendors? And so you just kind of go through that. Like our customers will give us uh, redacted invoices, you know, where we're like, oh, holy moly, like you're spending X per matter. Debate stamp. Per- the, cla- the classic charge is the charge to bait stamp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It still happens. Yeah, it's it's, happens. it's it is. We just got one uh, this uh, last week's Tuesday. They sent us invoices from e-discovery vendor for five matters, 
They spent $850,000 <laughs> on those five matters. And to put those in the logical, I mean, we're talking like a 90 eight percent cost reduction like this is so you're the, the, the invoice you're talking about there was just the actual storage and the process and all it wasn't even the services part the actual labor human labor involved just like the all the stuff that logical automates yeah you know the data ingestion promoting for review yeah. <laughs> adding users yeah. running searches like come on give me a break yeah and then the legal fees can be one where you can tap into that's a little bit more complicated but it's really around this kind of call the noise find the signal like Oftentimes what we're seeing is that non-sophisticated legal teams that maybe don't have the right incentives aligned are reviewing way more data than they should. Absolutely. And without question, we find that every day. Absolutely. Like in your business, like that is huge because you're using modern technology to cull a lot of data that should be culled before review. And that is immensely valuable because if you think about the average doctor review, like what's the cost? That's an easy math. It's like how much are you spending per hour and what's your review rate per hour and then boom, right. you know, three dollars an hour divided by 50 docs an hour and now you have a six dollar hour six dollar per doc rate and so you can apply that number times the amount of documents that you can pre-call and there's your savings yeah. you know but again it's hard sometimes to even when you quantify it's hard to explain it you know it's hard to actually explain the value but yeah so you, you um been in business for almost 10 years so for the longest time you were bootstrapped correct me if i'm wrong you Basically, you've raised funds twice. Is that right? Three times. Okay, three times. But there was a maybe, I don't know, it's probably about four years ago now, you raised I think, about 25 million bucks. Mm-hmm. But at the time, you really didn't need the money, but you still decided to take it. So I got two questions. I understand the bootstrapping model. It's the control, you know, it's you can you can grow your business the way you want to. But why did you stick to bootstrapping so long? Because it's very hard to do in SaaS. And then when you finally took the money, even though you didn't 100% need it, you still took it. How did that work? Why did you wait so long? And then what was it that pushed you over to, to take the check at that point? Well, remember, we came up with the idea for Logical in the Great Recession. And so there wasn't a lot of funding options for us. We didn't have a product. We were known as a services company. I did meet with investors at that time, but we didn't have any proof points. Right. Way too risky. You'd have to just bet on us as humans. And we didn't need it, you know? We did want it. We did want it because we knew with high confidence that if we were to bring on additional capital at a, at a good price, you know, healthy dilution, et cetera, that it would actually help us focus and accelerate because we were seesawing services and software, right? And so, like, if we could just focus on one thing and not two, Well, it's basic logic, like you're going to accelerate into that one thing. That did end up being true when we did raise uh, our first round of funding. But we needed to have some some points on the board because we're unproven entrepreneurs. We're in D.C. It's not really known as a tech hub. There was e-discovery out there at that point, and you're doing something completely different. The the interface is different. The way it's handled is different. It's self-serve. It's drag and drop. So when you say you have no points to offer them, so data points, that's you were literally starting from scratch. Yes, exactly. And we, uh, I mean, even to this day, people laugh us out of the room. You know, they think it's ridiculous what we're doing. Even, especially some of the larger competitors in the space, they think it's not a big market to go after, like what we're doing. And self-service is a naive idea for, for discovery. It's too complicated. I just got some of this recently because we just announced at the launch event logical AI with suggested tags, which I think you've seen a little bit of that. And some of the e-discovery experts, you know, are like rolling their eyes, like never, <laughs> not, not possible, you know, it's like, okay. So we had to get some points on the board because of our position. And um, once we had points on the board, it was fairly easy. We had, you know, raving customers and Revenue was growing very, very quickly, you know, 300% or more year over year, big upsell opportunities, landing some key logos, all without really a sales force and a single business to focus on. And so we raised our first round of funding in 2015, I believe, two years after launching the product. So we had two years of data, over a million dollars in annual recurring revenue at that time, growing rapidly. And this day, it's kind of funny, I'm looking back at some of the data, I'm like, damn. 
if <laughs> four months ago before the market started to correct, if we were to fast forward that company, like logical then to four months ago, we would have been able to raise a round of funding at like hundreds of millions of dollars pre-money valuation. Yeah. <laughs> like just bananas. Our, but our first round of funding, the valuation was like 15 million bucks. Right. Um, I thought it was like, oh, wow, that's awesome. Like that's a lot of money. Well, to your point too, you just pointed out that for a long time, your sales force wasn't huge. And it's still, I don't think it's huge, huge. You rely on a lot of inbound sales. But yes. I think part of the reason is this. You by far have some of the top-notch customer service out there. For, I think for pretty much any tech company, but definitely we'll just stick to legal tech here. I can attest to it. And that goes a long way to selling products without a salesperson being involved. I assume early on you made a conscious decision. We are going to have the best customer support that we can possibly have, right? That's right. And what was it that you put in motion at that way back 10 years ago to make sure that happened? And it did, in fact, happen. It did happen. What did you do? Well, I mean, first of all, like SaaS is an acronym and it stands for software as a service. It's not just software. And so, you know, we, we take that service component as an opportunity to enhance the software in a, a variety of ways. You can never really fully remove the human element. And so it enhances the software in a variety of ways because it helps people do their jobs, right? And the team is also funneling information to us that they're like um, bat signals or like red alerts. It's like, oh, oh, this is broken. You know, this is not a good user experience. This is happening too much. We need to fix that. And so we use it as a feedback channel to improve the product. And that's turned out to be great. And that, that team works backwards from a really simple question. We, we ask this, uh, all the teams at Logical, it's like, what would be a world-class experience? Like, what's a 10 out of 10, 11 out of 10? And work towards that, right? You'll never really get there, but like work towards that and operate on a, um, a simple levels of, of value fundamentals. You know, like we have five core values, like we use those as decision making tools every single day and it just works out. It's not that complicated. And it's shocking that few people would actually do that. In the legal space in particular, I think it's probably even more important. And that's because people that are using legal tech software or t technology that's specifically built for legal tech they're not used to a lot of advanced business software. That's just not been their life. You know, they, they're using some really crappy tool that was built in the 1980s and that's still in their law firm, you know, or in-house counsel, or they're doing something manually. And you need a, a helping hand. And so we hire people, I think you're referencing mainly the in-app chat support. We also have like e-discovery solutions architects, people that know all the products and, and processes, but that, the internal team is primarily staffed with former e-discovery paralegals you know, that used to work at like large law firms and uh, they get it, right? And so you're basically getting like this highly experienced e-discovery paralegal that's on tap as part of your software subscription. So whenever you have a question, you can chat with them and it doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything. So you just mentioned that when you're dealing with legal tech, a lot of times you have users that haven't necessarily used tech a bunch before. So you got to kind of keep that in mind. But I also heard you say at some point, I think it was a couple of years ago, the number may have changed, but about 40% of Logical's customers are not law firms or in-house legal departments. And of those, a lot of them are cutting edge. And so you're hearing what they want. And I think this was the quote I pulled out. A lot of them want a modern approach to doing business, plain and simple. Yeah. What specifically are they looking for? The modern approach. What is an in-house legal team? We'll stick to e-discovery here, obviously, because we're talking Logical. What are they wanting? What are they telling you? Number one, it's it's ease of use. Like it's kind of a it's an easy one, but if you unpack it, there's a lot of deep reasoning why that is. And I think the the number one issue as it relates to ease of use is resource constraints. So if you think about the the in-house legal teams, they get less than one percent of revenue for headcount. Right. Compare that to R and D at a tech company. It's going to be 20, 30, 40%. We spend 40% of revenue on, on research and development or sales. Sales can sometimes be 50% or more, right? And legal is a cost center. And so they're just not going to have the type of resources, people and product and even processes to manage the complexities of a modern organization. You know, like in-house legal, they got fires constantly. It's 
way different than law firms because they not only have to manage like the legal risks, the disputes, the investigations, but they're also dealing with all kinds of other things and business contracts. I mean, it's all of they're kind of they're the glue that holds a lot of the organization together. And uh, it's a really important function. So if you think about that, they're moving around constantly. They get all these different priorities that they're they're restacking. The last thing that they want or need is some 146 page user manual telling them how to upload, you know, a PST file. Like it's just, that's bananas, right? And it's not gonna work. And so like that ease of use is paramount to their success of using the products in the first place. The other thing that kind of goes into that is more of a, just their experience with other products that are non-legal are probably such that, at least if it's a modern SaaS product, that it's probably more consumer grades. And so they pattern match. They're like, why isn't this like that? Yeah, I, that, that has been the mystery to me since I got into legal tech is, you know, it's, it's changing now. It's changing now. But for so long, the legal tech user experience has been way different than the consumer UX. And we're all using these products every day in our, in our, in our non-work lives. So. Yeah. And to your other your earlier question, like that's why like you've got to build your company, your product intentionally so that you can attract people outside of the legal ecosystem. Right. That's where you're going to get those people that have that experience. Right. It won't work otherwise, most likely. So one of the stated goals has been from the beginning of the company is you, Logical wants to democratize e-discovery. Mm-hmm. In a perfect world, what does a democratic e-discovery process look like? <laughs> well, no user interface in Logical. And I, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So if you think of like dis- discovery is just this uh, sharing of information between parties, right? And discovery software exists as a net to filter, to make sure that you're sharing the right stuff and not the wrong stuff. That's kind of the e-discovery ecosystem, right? So what happens when the technology gets so advanced that a lot of that analysis is done faster and a higher level of accuracy, that filtering analysis, right? That's done by machines. And not only that, but it's also shared in a higher accuracy with the requesting party. So imagine a scenario, uh, and I'll use a public records example. Let's say a journalist at the New York Times wants information from the city of New York as it relates to whatever they're writing about, right? And they file this request. And that request goes into some machine and reads it and says, oh, they need this, this, and that, right? And so they, imagine like a librarian going down into the halls of the library and pulling out all the different books, but it's a robot. And so you're going through that and then you're sifting through all the pages and say, okay, well, they don't need this. Oh, this needs to be redacted. Uh, no, this doesn't need to be there. And you've packaged it all up. You've alerted some other human that says, hey, this re- request, this is what came in. This is the uh, the result. This is the percentage of confidence that we think is correct. This is how, inform- how much information was redacted. Do you want to review it before it goes out or you know, click this button and ship it, right? That is most likely where this technology will go for the vast majority of discovery. Now, the big stuff, the big document reviews, and that's never going to stop. Right. Like those will always, always exist. It's just you're going to have to use better, smarter technology, yada, yada. But the vast majority of discovery events that we have this kind of exchange of information between parties will eventually get to a point where there will be hardly any human involvement at all and to the point where maybe there will be no human involvement. So you want a microchip in people's head. You want the 5G, the 5G shot. <laughs> no, not at all. It's just the job to be done. It's like, okay, <laughs> these are the jobs to be done. Like, this is the shit we have to do. You know, it's like, okay, this is a task. You know, So like, if, it, if the job can be done by a computer faster, cheaper, smarter, then it will be. Like, it's just that that is what's going to happen. And discovery is a digital game of logistics. You're just shipping bytes, you know, different parts of the world. It's just done in an insanely inefficient manner today. So (laughs) you reduce that friction, you add some intelligence, you're naturally going to increase velocity. And uh, and I think overall, that's that's a really good thing uh, for, for society. Andy, appreciate your time today. People want to learn more about you. Get in touch with you, learn more about Logical. Where do you want to send them? Logical.com, spelled L-O-G-I-K-C-U-L-L.com. 
And then me, I'm on Twitter at IDDupe because that's like the first thing that Logical does is it deduplicates all of your files for you because it's a lazy software. It doesn't want to do more work than it needs to. And uh, of course on LinkedIn less so, but yeah. Well, that's it for another episode of Technically Legal. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can catch us on most major podcasting platforms like Stitcher, Google, Apple, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. If you like us enough, I hope you leave us a nice review. If you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. Until next time, thanks for listening. This has been another episode of Technically Legal.